the abuse that happened to children, when we watched Rama do it, we had to shut off our feelings, and he would a lot of many times he would make a joke out of it to take away the the fear and the serious side of it. He would make a joke out of these children or, or um, you know the naughtiness that the children were doing. He would make us laugh about it. So there, again, you know, the word that keeps coming into this picture is sadistic. He would turn something that would be which which should have been horrifying into a sadistic laughing insanity that we became a part of. Eventually, and not not just eventually, where it was taken away from him because he continued to whip, beat, put children in barrels, do all these insidious type of things to the children. But there was this one member of the group who was a spokesman for Rama many times. He stood up and he railed on the brother and he said, Brothers should not have to be disciplining your children. You should be disciplining your own children. It's up to you to make your children behave at home so when they come here they sit down and behave. Which turned into making all the adults be abusers themselves. You know, we ourselves, you know, use belts, we use whips, we use pieces of wire. We did everything that Rama did against on our children. You know, and this is where, you know, people are scared to come forward because in our insanity that in our that we lived under there, we became these abusers just like what Rama did. We we emulated what he did, and this man <laughs> yelled at us for not doing it and for not raising our children to be disciplined. Well, violence and, and abuse is not the way to raise children. And he, as the years went by and these children turned into this group of wild, uncontrollable brown shirts or whatever, you know, this mob, we saw it did not work to abuse our children. And there was no controlling them anymore by that time. It was totally out of control. And the children turned on the, dad, the fathers especially. Some of them turned on the mother. Threw the fathers down on the floor, beat the crap out of them. You know, it's just like so. All of the all of the discipline, all the yelling, and all of the teaching that Rama did about being strict on your children, totally came to a head in total chaos. It, it didn't work. Um, it, it it only you know like when I look when I just it buzzes through my mind, all the different children who ran away, all the different children who I've met with now that I'm out. These children are all destroyed. They, can't, they do not know how to cope. They do not know how to keep, they can't keep a job because when, when the employer or another worker starts yelling when there's a conflict, the flashback, the triggers of Rama yelling at them, they just walk off the job. They can't keep a job. They can't keep a relationship, a boyfriend, girlfriend, or, you know, there's not many of them that have gotten married yet, but the ones who do, the marriages don't work, the relations don't work. You know, this is all goes back to the things that, you know, the abuse. Uh, much, a lot of the abuse I didn't get, actually get to see. I, I, I saw my share, I will admit to that, uh, that Rama did. But much of the time Rama had me working on construction projects, furniture projects, whatever. And so other people saw way more abuse than what I actually did. From the very beginning of this group, Rama told us that the love mush gospel of Christianity, the very word, God is love, or I love you, was all false. That people don't really mean it when they say, I love you, or, or you know, God is love, and all this kind of cheap gospel. So the very concept, the very word love, the very concept of love was erased from this gospel, from our, his doctrine, from our way of life. We lived in a very much like the 1984 George Orwell, Orwell, the Big Brother Society, where we were required to tattle on each other. No private life was allowed. He preached every week for a long time on private life. We could, were not allowed to do anything without getting an okay from Rama, whether it be changing our oil, whether it be uh, making a job appointment, anything, we had to get an okay. We were all on the phone with Rama at least once a day, if not two or three times a day. Um, there was a rule and a regulation for every aspect of our life, which toothpaste to use, how to soap up our washcloth, how long to take a shower, you know, for the women, what tampons to use, uh, for the married couple, what sexual position we could use, and, and all the negative things about sex. There was, the, I mean, our most intimate and private parts of our lives were not private. We, we were told what to do with every part of our life. Um, this concept was carried out to a point 
where he would set up rules that, could, that nobody could follow, especially against the men. In our daily lives, we were required to check in. We were, we were told to do things out of order for what our normal work schedule would be. Um, we were told to do things that were just plain out of order for any schedule. That would, they did not make sense, but we were told to do them. We could not follow through. It was impossible to do these things. So Rama would start yelling at us for not obeying the word of God and obeying the servant of the Lord. Well, then in the, in the congregation meetings on the weekends, then Rama would make us stand up and publicly ridicule each of the men for not obeying his word. And then he would turn around and tell the wives or the, the women of the group that if the man of the house isn't going to follow the Lord, then they need to become the head of the house and they need to listen to brother and bring up their children in the ways of the Lord. Well, that worked. That turned the women against their own husbands or the, uh, the women against the single men even in the group who weren't obeying. <coughs> but eventually, that wasn't enough. Rama wanted to get the children away from the mothers too. So he started uh, the rules, regulations, whatever, that the women couldn't keep up with. The same thing happened to them. So Rama talked directly to the children and told them that your mother and father are just Christians. They, they're not going to obey the, the Hebrew ways, the true ways of the Lord. So you listen to, to brother, and brother will bring your ways up, your lives up in the ways of the Lord, and you will be blessed children, and, and you will become famous people in your, as you grow up. And so these children were turned into what's comparable to the brown shirts in Hitler's army. These children were turned into a, a group of brutal renegades who would do anything, I mean, right down to killing, an, uh, killing somebody if Rama told them to. And there were different incidents where these children were sent, were told to go at night and grab some of the, an older person out of their sleeping bag, take them outside, beat them to a pulp, throw them in the snow, smash their face in the ice, whatever, and leave these people there. And we watched this happen different times. And this, the, the society became so, this group became so out of control that even Rama could not control and the children started doing things which were out of control. I mean, totally out of control. He could not, the parents couldn't control them anymore because they wouldn't listen to them anymore. They realized that this whole thing was a big farce or a game, you know, inside their being. Even though Rama talked about Jesus being God and it was a very Christian fundamental thing and read the Bible all the time, these children had no concept anymore of what God was. The very concept of God had been destroyed by living their life in this squalor, in this poverty, in, in this insanity that the parents lived in. To a point where the children started having sex among themselves, among brothers and sisters. The, they started sneaking out, going to movies, the immorality and all the things that we were taught against. These children openly or privately just snuck out away from their families. Many of them ran away from home. There was, to the, at this point, there's probably not one family that is really intact where the husband and wife had much to, they may be still married. But there is no respect for the husband and wife. In every family, some of the children have run away. In many of the families, either the husband or the wife have left. And this group is in a, in a place of pure paranoia right now. After I left, I found out from, I called a member who was still in the group a few weeks after I left. He told me that right after I left, Rama went into a rage and started yelling at all the people that were still in the group that they're either going to follow Rama's ways to a T, exactly the way he said, or else get out of there. And then he pointed to some of the, to the children in the group, and he kicked them out. It was the first time it had ever happened in the history of the group, but he kicked children out of the group. And, and so they were, again, this feeling of abandonment, you know, before it was older people or children running away or whatever. But now to literally be kicked out of the group was a whole new thing. So this is the kind of dynamic that we're facing I have gone to Paul Martin, one of the best known uh, cult psychologists in the country. I have a 100 page manuscript telling, detailing this whole story, which I'd be glad to share with people if they want to email me um, or contact me. After reading this 100 page manuscript and spending a day interviewing me, Paul Martin said this is one of the worst cult cases that he has ever come across in all the years that he's been doing his work. He talked with one of the uh, young girls who was. Uh, from this group, she went through the full three-week inpatient treatment center program at, at Wellspring. After all the assessments and interviews, Paul Martin has a rating scale of mind control that he uses to rate where the, how much mind control people were under. Uh, I was told that 
most calls fall in a number around 85. The top end of the scale is, is around 140. He had put Rama, the mind control that we were under, at 130. It was the highest rating he had ever given a cult. I knew we were in a bad cult. I knew we had, bad things had happened, but I didn't know there was all these other cults out there. I did not know the, the magnitude of what cults had permeated our society and the world. But to know that among all the cults that are out there, we had, our group, had one of the highest ratings of any group, and that this is one of the most insidious groups that has ever been run across, it, it very much puts a greater fear into me, and the dedication is even more, more in me that we have to do something, and this is very serious. I'm going around finding these ex-members, um, trying to get them to come out of their shell because once you leave this group, it's like you leave alone, you're totally isolated, you don't belong anymore to the, to the world, to the society that we came from, and we can't go back to the group anymore. And so there's this alienation that is undescribable. It's like I was in there for 25 years, and when I came out of there, it was like Rip Van Winkle winking up from, waking up from 40 years of sleep. I didn't belong anywhere anymore, and I did, couldn't associate with the world anymore. I didn't know who I was, how I fit in, and I had to totally start my life all over again. The reason that I left, I'm going to bring this point up now. I, my, the son had had run away when he was 14. His name is Ebenezer. He's 22 years old at the time. He had come. To, he wanted to visit me, and so he, we made arrangements where I worked at at a commercial construction site. I was doing finished carpentry in a in an elderly care retirement home. And some of the apartments were dumb, so I made arrangements with the supervisor that he could stay in one of the apartments there. And while he was staying there, I stayed overnight so we could have time to talk together and stuff, and then he worked with me during the day. Well, and then we went to the grocery store one night, and someone from the group saw us at the grocery store, went back and told Rama about it. And I don't know exactly the details. I never did find this out. But somehow my 17-year-old son got stirred up. And on a Saturday night, when I was sitting down at my house by myself, eating supper, he came up to me, wanted to know where Ebenezer was at, and I said, I'm not going to tell you. And he threatened to kill me and started yelling and swearing at me, threw me down on the floor, got on top of me, with, put his legs across my chest, and I was laying flat down on the floor. He took his fist, smashed me right into my cheekbone, <laughs> and I didn't get knocked out, but I literally saw stars flo floating and... and he must have scared him because he stood up away from me, let me get up, but then he just went back at it again. For about 15 minutes, he started threatening me, wanting to kill me, wanted me to fight with him so that he could punch me and stuff. And I just stood there. I wouldn't fight with him. He went upstairs, came back with a piece of paper. On the paper, he had written, Galen Prebri has been warned to go straight or to get out. And he had put a line there for me to sign. He said, sign this. And I said, I won't sign anything. And I threw it on the floor. He swore at me, went out the door, and went back up to Rama's compound. That night, for the very first time in 24 years, I knew that my life in that group had ended and I had to get out, but I, had, I didn't know how to go about it, what to do. I knew I had to talk to somebody. The only person I knew to talk to was Rama himself, so I went about 4 o'clock in the morning up to the compound, tried to call him from my cell phone, and he did answer the phone. I asked if I could go to the front of the house to talk to him, but he said that some, he had been hurt the night before, which is an odd coincidence. He had been climbing up a ladder and had cut his head open on a, a roof truss. And to this day, I believe that there was some coincidence, but nothing is coincidence, but something had happened to him the same time my son had hit me. Um, he wouldn't talk to me. He told me to go home and tell my wife and my children why Ebenezer had come back. So I went home and tried to talk to my wife. She didn't want to talk to me. They were getting ready to go to the Sunday morning meeting. So after they left the meeting, I didn't know who else to call. I called the sheriff's department. And I just in desperation, I told the dispatcher that I needed to talk to somebody. I had a terrible domestic problem. He said, well, come in and the deputy will talk to you. So I went into the sheriff's department, sat down with this deputy, and I told him right, off the, right from the start, I said, you cannot write up a report. You can't take any notes, nothing, because if any of this gets found out from the cult leader, he will send people to kill me. And I knew that there was a lady who sits up from the group who sits up in front of Rama's house as a guard at night in her car and watches for passersby in, her, in other cars. 
And if anybody does something even a little bit wrong, like squealing a tire or yelling out the window, she chases after them. She has a video camera to record their car, their license plate number, and she calls up the, the sheriff department on the phone, and the sheriff department chases after them also, and then they arrest the people, bring charges against them for harassment or um, vandal, whatever, vandalism or whatever. And she goes in the next day, to, every day, to check up the court records or the, the police records to see whether or not <coughs> they have followed up on this case and what they've done about it. So I knew that this happened, and the deputy that I was talking to also knew this lady and knew that she did this process. So he sat there, and I, for about 45 minutes, got to just start telling him about the things that were happening in the group. And... He got called out to a um, car accident, so he had to stop the interview, and he said, I want to talk to you again, so I went back again the next night. During this all these conversation, I told him something that I had done while I was in the group. He turned around, talked to his supervisor. Somewhere in the middle of the next day or two, they had a discussion in the sheriff department, and the way I found out about this, the very thing that I told him not to do, they had done. They had talked among themselves, the information got to the district attorney. This woman from our cult found was a good friend of the district attorney. The district attorney and her or the sheriff people talked with her. She went back, told the cult leader. So the, the all the information that I said had been given to the cult leader. He called me up on the telephone and started yelling at me for going to the sheriff department and telling these things. So there's all kinds of... Right away, there's issues. They did not read me Miranda rights. They did not stop my interview when they saw that I was under duress. They did not, or they didn't keep my confidentiality, and which endangered my life. So there's all kinds of issues that have come up now on what they did. But since then, they took the one sentence that I said of something that I had done. Instead of doing a proper investigation on the whole cult, cult history and all the abuses, everything else that has gone in there that the cult leader has done, they took the one sentence that I had said, turned it around, they sent a sheriff investigator to talk to me, and now I have criminal charges against me. So now I've had to go find an attorney, I've had to find a psychologist to get counseling with. I've gone around the country, called around all over the place, getting cult experts to help me out. Um, every resource that I can come up with, we're trying to bring, turn this whole thing around, get the focus off of what I did as an individual, and get a bigger picture on this whole cult dynamic, the mind control that the cult leader had on us, and the abuses and everything that went on, <laughs> that the cult leader himself did, and that he either taught us to do or forced us to do, it forced us into situations where we did things which ended up being criminal, criminal acts. Um, the local officials, the sheriff department, the social service, the, the school nurse, the school officials, they have all known about what goes on in this group for 20-some 20, 20 years, over 25 years. They have not done anything about it. This is the, the biggest problem that we've got. The local people, are there's something wrong there. The whole law uh, enforcement program has somewhere broken down. They're protecting Rama or are scared of him. We don't know which, but there's something definitely going on. So we are trying to have gone around to get the ex-members involved. All of them are scared to death to come forward. They've either gone on with their life, don't want to remember or talk about their past, or else they're scared of criminal charges being brought against them. And so it's very hard for these people to come forth to do interviews or to write stories or to even discuss what has happened in the past. A few of them have. Uh, we have a TV station now that is starting to do interviews with us and putting together a documentary. Um, Hopefully this will it'll start out as a local documentary. Hopefully it will get on to 2020 or one, a Dateline or one of these eventually. Um, I've attended different conferences uh, to tell about this whole case, what's going on with it. You know, we're trying to get more support, more people who may know other attorneys or other legal avenues that we can take and uh, get some support that way. If anybody wants to contact me, my email address is GP, my initials, uh, GP Lone Wolf, L O N E W O L F, at yahoo.com. Um, I gave my phone number earlier. Anybody, any time, day or night, if you've got kids in a cult, if you've got, if you're out of just getting out of a cult, um, 
or any other reason you want to call me, be, I'm free. I'm I'm glad to talk to about anybody day or night. So please contact me. I will share my information with you. And if you have anything you want to share with me, again, I put out a plea. We need financial help. We need any support we can get for our cause. Um, if you need more information, want to talk about it more, I'm glad to talk.